on to the FDP subaward template update. Uh, today we're going to be doing an overview of the changes for the 2017 template. We're just going to look at the major changes to the templates and some of the new documentation that accompanies the 2017 template. My name is Amanda Humphrey. Um, I am fortunate enough to be one of the co-chairs of the subaward subcommittee on the FDP, and I am joined today by uh, my co-facilitators, Stephen Scott and Amanda Haymaker. They are my fellow co-chairs from the committee. They're both on the call, uh, but Stephanie will field most of the questions and, and kind of let me know uh, if I'm keeping on track or not. We're going to do our best to answer as many questions as we can today. However, if you do have questions that we didn't answer, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box as we go through the webinar. Anything we don't get to, at the end, we will create an Excel spreadsheet and answer those questions, and we'll send that out on the listserv at a later date. Um, Steffi, I know that you just had a quick update on the guidance that you wanted to share with everyone, so do you want to go ahead and do that part? Um, hi, everyone. So this is Stephanie, and um, I oversee the guidance document working group. And so along with this, and Amanda, you're going to talk about um, some of the minor, minor, minor changes that were made to the templates that are going to be posted on the website. We are anticipating that the SAQ's guidance document is going to be released tomorrow. We will notify you via the listserv. And I just wanted to give you a quick um, overview of what to expect with these FAQs. There were quite a few changes done this year as a result of several things. One is the release of the research terms and conditions. Another was the release of the FDP data transfer use agreements, guidance documents. All of these things impacted our existing FAQs. Uh, the template changes, there were some new questions, quite a few new questions that we added to our FAQs, um, in particular uh, for non-FDP members that use our templates. We have invoicing questions along with a whole bunch of other questions. And finally, we are proud to officially release the carryover guidance document, which is going to be incorporated with our FAQs as an appendix. Um, stay tuned. I just wanted to give some highlight, overview highlights of what to expect. And that's it. Great. Thanks. Um, so, like I said, we will make sure any unanswered questions get answered at a later date. The outline of this is basically that we're going to go through the cost reimbursement template the new reporting documentation that was created with this, this iteration of the templates. And we'll pause periodically for questions, uh, but if we have to move on for timing, we'll come back to it at, at the end of the session and or we will get back to you um, through email at some point in, in the future. So just to give a little bit of context, um, we've been getting a lot of requests to the templates over the, the past year or two, and we are receiving over 100 change requests Many were things like corrections of typos, requests to enhance consistent references, requests for new and modified language. We had added some use of name language in 2016, but just requests like that kept coming in. So we worked with a small working group to deliberate on the changes. Would the change present additional burden for either the PTE or the subrecipient organization? Was there a value added for any of the changes? Um, and we also decided to move to an annual template update cycle so that we weren't releasing, oh, we got this, you know, we had this typo over here, let's fix that, or this reference should actually be this. And posting them periodically throughout the year, we decided to just, well, release them in September if we have anything that needs to get updated. Um, so after we went through the process of review and change requests, Register from Stanford University, who were very fortunate to be uh, such a dedicated committee member who was able to go through and program all the fields. Um, but she and I went through and, and put all changes into the templates, and then Laura programmed all the fields into one fluid document. This is the first time that I can remember that we've had a single file uh, FDP template that auto populate fields and speed up template data entry. So that was a big part of our goal was to help everyone uh, do this a little bit more efficiently and effectively. Of course, one of the challenges 
approaches that we came up with was that every time we're releasing new documentation, every time we're releasing new templates, there are a lot of folks in our offices that we've got to communicate with. And one of them is, uh, would be our tech groups is an increasing population that we've got to talk to. A lot of institutions now are moving toward auto-populating templates or at least pulling some data fields from their system into their templates. Um, so really quickly, I just wanted to show everyone the SCP support forms page. We made some updates to the text of the page. And this is where you'll find the templates. Templates, the FAQs that Stephanie mentioned that will be posted in the next couple of weeks, as well as templates for international collaborators, which we should actually be able to post in the next week, though. This subcontract sample will be uh, in further detail in a couple of weeks. And we've got a, a link here to the data use and transfer agreement templates and guidance. We're posting a the webinar, so it's coming soon. And then these are the two documents that are new that I just want to show you really quickly. So I mentioned our friends uh, in our tech our offices. We've got this subword template field crosswalk, which outlines the fields, their locations, and uses for all the data fields in the various subword templates. So. Um, there's no Word version of the templates. We have gotten requests for, hey, can you make this a Word version of the template? It's just too hard to keep up, and we had built everything already into a PDF. So we are not going to be providing a Word version of the templates, but what we, you can reverse engineer and extract the templates into a Word document. And then to help you be able to do some of that auto-population and take advantage of the syllable field, that in the actual templates themselves, we've created this crosswalk that goes through every single field name, and then that's the name that it will be in the cost reimbursable template. This is the type of field if it's a drop down menu, radio button, um, checkbox. We've tried to also move to, towards some consistency on that, which I will describe in further detail in a few minutes. So for this one, you can see there's a drop down menu here. And you can see over here, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, um, there's a field description. So just tried to give some context for this is what we mean by this field. And if it's a drop-down menu in purple, you will see the different options separated by commas for what would populate into that drop-down menu. And then also, if in red, if it be a data field somewhere else in the template, where it's located. Then you will also see where this field located. And this and then it's so done by page, attachment one, attachment two, and so on and so forth. So hopefully this will help facilitate communication and to reduce development time for those institutions that um, do program their templates. All right. Um, from the other document that we implemented this year is a major changes document. It outlines the changes from the 2016 to the 2017 templates. It, um, I think I was really inspired for this by the NSF's major changes document, which helped to disseminate and update folks on the major changes, which is really helpful for training purposes. Um, so I'm again going to blow this up because I know that my screen probably looks a little bit smaller to everyone. Also help to facilitate any institutions that need to route their templates for legal approval, such as OGC or uh, risk management services, other offices in your institution, so that they are able to expedite their review by focusing on the major changes to the template. Um, and we did try and describe the purpose, the scope, and a couple of little notes about things in the template. So indicates that this is a text box, which is now there's a drop down, and what that populates through attachment two. Um, if we change a term and condition, we justify the change in the explanation column. And um, hopefully, again, that this will help with some discipline and training at your institution. So now we move on to the actual templates themselves. So everyone's aware 
I am not going to go through all the details of what we changed and corrected. There were a lot of changes that were just for consistency, grammar, my changes to make something easier to read. In this session, we're going to focus on the big picture, the major changes that may impact how you complete the template and or discuss sections of this template with your subrecipients. This overview will also assist subrecipients in understanding why changes may have been made so that when they're on the receiving end of those changes, they'll, they'll know how to get those conversations started. As I mentioned before, we do have single file templates now. We're only going to look at the cost reimbursable template today. We have the fixed price template up. We have continued to maintain separate attachments 3A and 3B as routing and filling in those forms. You might have pre-populated ones by J portfolio or for a particular PI, or you may want to send a separate file and lock down your cost reimbursable template when you send it to your subrecipient. So we did want to continue to offer those options for the community as well. Um, let's slow this up. So we have the cost reimbursable research subaward agreement. Um, global things to note just across this template. One that we really focused on this year was field formatting. We did our best to ensure that, that fields are formatted to assist folks in understanding what they need to do. So there are drop downs to select a single choice when there are many choices. There are blank fields to enter data. There are radio buttons when you have to select only one choice. And there are check boxes when you may select more than one option or when you are incorporating a choice. And we'll see this in further detail as we go through the document. We also implemented more consistent naming conventions for selections, especially because each PDF is a single file built from one file that allowed us to make it a little bit easier. Um, so when you type PTE name in here, your institution name in on the face page, it will automatically populate on attachment 3B anywhere else that we reference PTE. Um, and then we've also tried to make it a little bit easier to tab through the document. Um, but, you know, as, as much as we tried to QC everything and look at how all the fields went through, if you know anything, please just send us an email as you're working with the documents. I just want to let everyone know that you have to click out of a drop-down or tab out of it to ensure that any drop-down menus populate future fields. But as that, um, if, if you're here and you're looking for NIH, there's a lot of data about NIH that pulls on attachment two. I've gone here and I go down to attachment two. I didn't click outside the box. Um, it's still populated on this one, but um, it may not in other situations. I'm going to try toggling it to command. Oh, that's just populating. But careful because it may not do it everywhere it, throughout the template consistently. Okay. So, Stephanie, do you have, are there any questions? What came in. Um, why are there two question marks? See these question marks? Uh, were uh, left on the, why were they there? Uh, left on the cover page next to the start and end dates. Same marks are on attachment two. How do we remove them? Ah, well, uh, these, these little info carrots or buttons, actually little pieces of information to help us all get on the same page or be a little bit more consistent. So there has been some question about, you know, when do you, you what is the period of performance versus the project period? How do you understand the uh, what's obligated or, or what the obligation period might be? And so these little care, these little question mark boxes here um, basically help to clarify that. And then when you print to PDF or when you print the PDF, these will actually disappear but they hopefully will help to add a little bit more information to a field that we thought may not be super intuitive for everyone. To just help text. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so the agency here at the top will populate your choices on attachment two. We want to let everyone know that the other here, so um, as we say anything, the only the members that are listed here are actually FDP members. We only maintain the templates for FDP member agencies. So things like AHRQ, CDC, FDA, 
um, some branches of the government, they do not use, they're not FCP member institute or federal agency partners. So we don't maintain their references in the template. If you want to use this template for that, you're welcome to do so. I would say that some entities fit better in this than others. AHRQ, for instance, I think works very well in this template, but USID, I do not think is quite a good fit for the for the FDP subaward template. But it's an institutional decision. Um, so do select other and type in agency. You'll see when you click outside the box, the base appears so that you can type in AHRQ. And then when you go down here to the um, attachment two, this section um, that's interesting. Should, should, this should be blanked out, um, but it'd be blank, or you can fill in with whatever the correct reference or citation would be. The one thing we did do is we did provide other PHS, which HRQ is technically an other PHS, and that should continue to populate the correct reference under the financial conflicts of interest section to 42 CFR Part 50. And that was as far as we felt comfortable going in terms of um, adding in for non-member agencies. So I'll put this back to NIH for the purposes of the rest of the test. Um, so here you, you can type in, you know, say your university name, your subrecipient university name, and then you can put in your P names. I'm in a couple there. And if you notice, there's a sub award number here. And now there's a sub award number box that populate at the top of each and every page of the template. And with the PTE federal award number, if you type it in here, anywhere else that it needs to, it will auto-populate. We SD to all amounts. We're just trying to minimize differences with the foreign templates here. And um, somebody had asked a very good question about what these question mark boxes are. Our intent here is to clarify budget period and project period, which become more important when we get to term four. Um, so let's go see the actual terms that we've changed here. In term one, we removed the option to reference the proposal. I none of us had ever seen something come in where the subaward just referenced the proposal and felt that it was a better practice, especially with FAFA reporting requirements, to have the scope of work shown in attachment five and have any necessary budget documentation shown in attachment five. So we really just wanted to make that super clear by updating that term. Um, in terms two and four, we move the reference of two CFR three five um, from term four to term two notification for that was on the listserv a while back. I'm not going to rehash that all here in the interest of time. But we also added invoicing expectations and payment expectations. I guess this was discussed with the membership and there's some information on it in the FAQs that will be released next week and there, um, there was some discussion of it on the listserv and at the meeting in May. Similarly, information on this is in the FAQs, and this was part of the discussion around the terms two and four changes. The change to this term really added a clarification drop down for ND and, for, and asks entities to either select the project or the budget period, which are referenced above. Basically, if you're looking at the period of performance, that budget period, those are the dollars that are currently being obligated to the subrecipient for what period. If you want an invoice every year, um, then you would select budget period end date. If you want a final invoice at the end of the five-year segment, then the project you would select project period end date. Uh, and I would recommend using the budget period end date if you do not allow automatic carryover on a specific subaward. If automatic carryover is allowed, the project period end date is typically the more efficient option. Term seven, we added 
the point of contact for unilateral modification. That's not always the same as some of the other substantive changes, so we decided to add a drop down here. We have defaulted it to authorized official, which is the same as what's in term six. We all moved the old term 10 regarding no cost extensions to attachment two because we already had language in attachment two regarding no cost extensions as part of the prior approval section under general terms and conditions, which we will get to shortly. For term 11, we incorporated all the attachments to the sub award rather than having, then one thing that we did with the release of the new RTCs, rather than having the RTCs on both the face page and attachment two, they're not only stated on attachment two, but incorporated here by reference. This is also a big win space-wise because the research term and condition links would be slightly different for the Department of Defense RTCs versus most of the other agency RTCs. Um, okay, were there any questions that came in there? Uh, just the two things. One, Laura Register popped in to say hello and to give you a little reminder. It said, if you have selected another sponsor, you need to go back up to select to select from drop down options tab, then select your sponsor. You know, referring. To oh, yep. Yeah. Okay. If you're changing. You need to go here, tab out, then go up, select IH. It ensures that, that that information and gets incorporated in for the new sponsor. And then, secondly, awesome. which I believe you addressed already, but I think it's worth pointing out again. A person, then, is there a reason that HHS was not a selection in that drop down? And it goes back to your point on we all include really the FDP members. That there are only certain federal sponsors that are FDP members. And when it comes to HHS or PHS, really, NIH is the only one. However, you have in your drop down there, maybe you want to show this again. Yeah, other PHS. Other PHS. Right, right, and yep, that's exactly right. I will and then to attachment one. Um, there. Attachment one, we didn't make as many changes here. We really clear, cleaned up the formatting of the certifications. Uh, one that I just wanted to point out is, is previously had the whistleblower language in attachment two. We thought that the RTCs were going to incorporate fully the whistleblower attachment, but then when we saw the RTCs, the PDF had actually cut off um, <laughs> the whistleblower part, so we can't tell if the whistleblower has been fully incorporated into the RTCs and therefore doesn't need to be stated here. So in an abundance of caution, we decided to leave the program for enhanced of contractor employee protections, aka the whistleblowing language here, but just move it to attachment one. Since it's no longer a pilot program, it's applicable across all the agencies, it's there, it doesn't change from award to award. Um, I also just wanted to remind everyone, uh, because of membership requests, we had updated the use of name language in January 2017 and reposted it in January 2017. Um, but I just wanted to let you, anyone know who hasn't gone in and pulled the January 2017 version of the template that this will be different from the 2016 initial release. And to clarify the intent of the use of name language, perhaps the use of name for academic purposes, such as appropriate citation for a journal article, but ensures parties will not use each other's name for promotional purposes. Any questions? So far, we're good. Okay. So here, this is the part that most people will be the most excited about. So um, as I said, we selected our agency up on the face page, which is driven the pre-population of much of this page. When you select CP participating agency, all of the proper citations pre-populate. That means that here, under general terms and conditions, any relevant uh, grants policy statement or awarding agency website that may need to be uh, cited or incorporated, such as the PAPIG guide or the grants policy statement, the populate here um, under Article 1. Article 2 has any legal references, such as 45 CFR Part 75, 
or any other implementation of uniform guidance may be applicable. That there's um, any, anywhere where they look like their major announcements or their addendums, that will be here. And the research terms and conditions include any federal agency's award specific requirements. Um, will be found here on this NSF hosted website. And I get, I actually, we do get a lot of questions about this. The number one question. <laughs> it is. Click the link. When you're there, you will see the NSF is being really kind in hosting this for um, their colleagues across the various federal partners. So they post all of this information, but it's not just NSF information. The link is um, correct. Then, Even though it says NSF. It's correct. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then under 4A, I had mentioned that on the face page, we had taken away the information about the no-cost extensions from the face page and moved it here for consistency and clarity. And so that here it is. Here's the information about no-cost extensions. Um, I'm going to go back up for a quick second before we move on. I'm going to talk a little bit about the required data elements. So we have the so we have the required data elements. Some of them were moved from the face page back in like 2015 or 2016 to give a little bit more space on the face page. And um, when we did that, some institutions asked if we could just incorporate the federal award notice since that should already have some of these details piece of data rather than re-keying them in. So we have an option here for attached federal award, um, and that will be attached later in the document, or you can key it in as entered. And when we initially did this, when you did in the attached federal award, all of the fields over here on the right disappeared. However, some institutions indicated that they actually use these fields over here as a validation or a QC checkpoint for their staff. And so it was actually really important that we leave those fields there visible. So given both options, um, and then there's just a clarification here. If you're attaching the NOAA, it should be attached to attachment six, just a reminder. Um, but you do not have to both attach the notice of award and complete the award issue date, the same the CA number, and the CA title, because those should all be in the award notice. Here are the check boxes. We've defaulted the research and development um, confirmation to yes, since most of our sub-awards are going to be research and development. We defaulted it to yes, and so you would just uncheck it if it is not research development. And then subject to FAFATA, you still need to check that off. So added this new field, which is key personnel per the NOAA. Again, this is only something that you have to fill out if you are not attaching the federal award. Um, but it's it, this is for any key personnel named on the notice of award. Why did we add this? Because 25% prior approval to the feds is only for the folks that are as key personnel on the notice of award. Um, it's really an NIH specific thing. The NIH does not often call out subrecipient PIs as key personnel on the NOAA. It comes up probably about as often as the multi PI thing, but wanted to give that option there so that you could highlight if you've got a subrecipient PI that they are named on the notice of award as key personnel. You and your subrecipient know that because if their effort drops, you're not just preparing a request to ask to drop their effort to PT organization. That then has to be funneled on to the federal agency for their approval as well. So we just want to highlight that and give an opportunity for institutions to understand that a little bit better, have some more conversations around that. Um, okay. Now I'm just going to show you guys the multiple PI section. And I have our little our little question box that says select if one of the PTE federal awards includes multiple PIs and the subrecipient PI is the MPI on the federal award. Um, so what we've done here is we've tried to clarify whether or not this particular subaward 
is subject to an MPI leadership plan. So for a, um, a PTE institution, you have three subrecipients, but only one of them is an MPI, and therefore subject to the MPI leadership plan. That is the if you have other two subawards, you should leave this as the default. The subaward is not subject to an MPI leadership plan because your subaward to those other two institutions is not subject to the MPI leadership plan, that multi-PI leadership plan. However, if you are sent at the third subaward to your MPI co you need to select this option, which the subaward is subject to an MPI leadership plan. Both of these will follow the finalized MPI leadership plan. And again, you're going to need to tab out. And it will show you that the MPI plan is attached as part of attachment six, which we'll see in a minute, or will make the MPI plan available upon request. Um, this box will only show up if you have an NIH award, since multiple PIs are only part of NIH awards. That's something the other agencies typically do. Uh, before we move on from the general terms and conditions, I had forgotten just to mention to everyone really quickly, you may notice here that carry forward has been moved. It's been moved to attachment four. Again, there were some prior discussions about that. There'll be some more detail on that in the guidance document that will be posted soon. Just want to point that out. Um, so now for copyright, we made selection a drop down this year. Last year it was a checkbox. And then also added a sentence per discount on the listserv and at I think the main meeting. More else will be in guidance. Um, but just so you know, this, this is the sentence that we added right here. This uh, really the big debate about this boiled down to ensuring that the PTE has what they need to be able to make their reports and deliverables to the federal government under the main federal award. And hopefully this carve out will ensure that uh, those institutions that prefer grants to shall grants will now be more comfortable accepting shall grant as an option when a subrecipient organization feels that it's important to. There's a lot of new FAQs on that topic. So watch yeah, them. Yes. <laughs> Read them thoroughly. Ask us questions. Um, Data and access. This one that we got a lot of questions about as well. So we've tried to clarify that this section is only applicable when the PTE needs to draw attention to a data sharing requirement, especially for those beyond the standard agency requirements. Such as when the agency notes the plan in the NOAA. The plans may not be available to the sub since they don't have the full proposal. You may want to attach them as a separate attachment or do it upon request. Both options are available to you here in the down. So really our goal there was to, um, was to help simplify that process a little bit. This is for the PTE to complete, not the subrecipient. But if the subrecipient thinks that there is something special uh, that they had submitted and doesn't see it checked, then you know, definitely ask the question. I did take out the phrase public access because folks were getting confused with public access policy requirements, especially around publication, that's all slowed down by various grant policy statements and the NOAA if it's attached. So we just wanted to make it really clear that this really has to do with ensuring access to data, uh, access that is specific to a particular award and above and beyond what's typically required by the agency in their grants policy statement. Um, really, Steph, are there any questions? No, <laughs> not yet. yet. Okay. Um, COI. COI is pretty easy this time around. The relevant agency citation auto populates when you select the agency at the top. And so when, uh, when you select other, a box, will eventually, a box will appear here where there's a gap, and you'll be able to enter the citation as well as um, this will populate as, as the um, specific federal award, the federal awarding agency, the other federal awarding agency that you've selected. So if you can't find the citation, you can just kind of say, what the Department of Energy's policy may be. Um, okay. Humans and vertebrate animals. This was under one. Um, where the biggest change here is a change from 
animal subjects to vertebrate animals. That's to be more consistent with references through OLAW or um, USA and how most folks IACUC operates. They refer to vertebrate animals as opposed to animal subjects. We wanted to be more consistent. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick refresher. If there are no humans or animals, click on and the fields will go away. So first you have to uncheck that. And then that, and this section is blank. If you do have human subjects, um, it, it allows you to select here where the verification of your IACUC approval should go and when you require it. Um, so for some institutions, they want the, um, a copy of the IRB approval letter prior to execution of the agreement. Others want it every year. Some institutions only want it upon request. Um, and then it may, it may be that there are human subjects, but they're, they're, uh, an approval letter is not required for the following reason. Maybe it's because there's an SIRB. The IRB designated somehow the research has been deemed exempt or approval will be sought after year one. We just wanted to give some options there for that. Uh, okay. And then if you select vertebrate animals, a menu will pop up and it will specify the IACUC requirements. And those are pretty similar that, you know, if you need to for a particular reason, the alliance agreement or if the approval will be sought after the first year. You can indicate that. And then you can take that stuff away. If you take those away, these will these will still appear, but they, they won't have any information in them. Um, and Laura will, Laura's probably shaking her head at me right now. Um, but I think I have to blank this box at first. And then if I uncheck this box, ah, it goes away entirely. There we go. Um, there we go. Sorry, go ahead. Before we do the human subjects data part, um, I'm wondering if you want to answer a question because someone asked something on management plan. Um, okay, so the question said was, question about data management plans. If the plan is included as part of the proposal, should it be included in the sub-award if it's not specifically mentioned in the award? That's question. My inclination would be Especially if you're working with like NIH, they are a data management and sharing plan with everything, right? And so you put that in. If it's it's kind of the standard, hey, we're going to make our data available somewhere in the future. Thank you. Then I probably would not bother to do it. But if you've got a particular project where you, your PI has has indicated that the data management or the data sharing is like that's the project and it's such an important component and that you know they've done something really special or unusual and and you know that um, even if it's not specifically called out in the notice of award and make sure that the subrecipient is aware because you think it's unusual for a particular reason then I would check the box um, this is really to give the PTE flexibility to say, wait a minute, we really want to make sure our subrecipients understand that it's not just the standard, you know, being transparent being right. bit and making information publicly available. There's something right. particular here. This is not necessarily a required field. There, the, I think the PTE right. has some flexibility on how to use this section. And Amanda was saying it's to call out to the subrecipient when it's important for them to follow the data management or data sharing plan from the original proposal if it impacts them. Some of the management plans or sharing plans, the subrecipient doesn't follow that exact plan. They might be following something else, but this is a little bit subjective in terms of, you know, whether you include it or not. Right. Absolutely. So subjects data use. Um, the biggest change that we made here is that we actually made a section, human subjects data will not be addressed in this agreement. One of the questions that we had, or some of the feedback that we had received from patients was that human subjects data information, DUAs, that, that type of information sits in another office. And we can't easily get the validation or the information about that. 
And in other institutions, they're not issuing the DA. They know that, that there's human subjects data. They want to address it in the FTP subaward template because they don't want to have to do a separate data use agreement. So we're trying to give the flexibility to say, this office, we're not doing this. It's applicable or it is applicable. Um, so then, so you have some clarity as both the PT and the subrecipient. Are they affirmatively telling me whether or not this is applicable or not applicable, or affirmatively telling me we don't deal with this, we don't know whether or not it, it's, it's really part of this package. You will have communication basically right. from someone else's not or, a care. Or it cannot be determined at the time of the subaward. Exactly. Um, so if you select not applicable or not addressed in this agreement, the sector remains intentionally blank. If you select applicable and then hit tab, uh, then you're going to see human subjects data will be exchanged under the subaward and then got the direction of the data. And again, you can select both. You can select one. And then you can select whether there will be a separate data use agreement or if you're going to use the additional terms section below. And then here we've got another box just indicating our, our recommendation for additional terms is when they're required by the federal award for human subjects data or additional terms as may be required by risk assessment. So our plan with this human subjects data, if you, um, you know, we do hope to soon be able to have standard additional terms language that you can copy and paste to this section. Um, if, you, if you're going to have de-identified data fully, identifiable PHI, et cetera, but it's not yet. Um, the TUA group is, is working on a lot of other stuff, and eventually our plan is to work with them to pull together some language. So you'll hear more about that on the listserv, hopefully in the coming months. Uh, we just wanted to, to keep you up to date. If you do want to incorporate additional terms, I do have some sample language from one of my previous institutions um, that they are willing to share. So I'm more than happy to share that with anyone if you just email me separate on the side. Other questions? Um, I got another question related to data sharing and access. Uh, focus okay. on that one. Um, and I'm not sure if I understand the question fully, but it's, here it is. Is it? Board requires the creation of a publication policy, which all governs data use. Would that be considered data sharing and access? Publication yeah, policy for the project. I mean, I'll reiterate what you said earlier. We're not talking about public access to publications here in that section. So, for example, the H public access policy regarding publications, that's not what we're talking about in terms of data sharing and access because that's already flowed down through the notice of awards or the applicable grants policy statement. Um, right. The creation of a public publication policy, which also governs data use, would that be considered? I, don't know I think I know what they're sure. talking yeah. about. Okay. Oh. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so, what I believe they're talking about, and please type angrily. I no, we're wrong. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes with a clinical trial, there will be a publication plan. That's the context I have seen it most frequently. So, you'll have a big multi site clinical trial of some kind, and you don't want one site publishing just their data before you've put together and published and, and done everything with kind of the larger data set. And sometimes they'll have a publication policy about, you know, typically this is when we expect to release the, the group publication and if it's not released this time, you can um, release it on your own. Or if you have a particular case study, something really unusual that um, we'll be able to exception process that you can follow and will deem whether or not it's somehow going to interfere with a larger publication. So I think that's what they mean, um, if that is the case. I would say that that's usually in the clinical trial sample that we have on the website, and I believe that that would be appropriately covered there. 
So I would I would kind of look at um, if it's not what you mean, maybe contact me offline and we can look at that specific situation. But I would you said yes, say, that's it. So I I think that's what she I think you hit it. All right. Wow. All right. Um, okay. Great. So moving to attachment three then, um, as you, you can see, I support Harvard University would be the pass through entity, and you can see that it auto populated the, my university name. And then and since I had typed in my PI name on the PTE contacts, that are populates below in the PTE contacts. So we actually did make a lot of changes to attachments 3A and 3B. Mostly what we focused on was restructuring data entry. What we did is we put the PTE general information at the top, including a new field here for your um, your office's website. A lot of times this portfolio has changed. People need to find something. It's not always easy to get to the right office when some of these really large universities, so you can now customize and say, if you need to get, it, um, get to our website to maybe find a new contact or something, this is where We also consolidated the primary points of contact to names, emails, and phone numbers in the middle. Um, and the reason that we did this is because this is the information that people are most frequently looking for, a central email box, the piece contact, the admin contact, a CO email if needed, find contact, where to send those invoices. A lot of people like to have their invoices email now, and the authorized official name. Below, um, since a lot of people aren't using snail mail anymore, we've actually moved the addresses down and we consolidated them into a single box. The intent of this is A, for programming purposes so that Programmers don't have to program to each individual zip code field or each individual city field. They can just program those address blocks. It also gives more latitude for addresses to be uh, entered by foreign recipients or foreign PTEs consistent with their general practice. Um, I, the, the postcode or zip code nomenclature is gone. The addition of it being a U.S.-based award is kind of removed from particular contact. And then, um, hopefully, if you don't pre-populate, do it this way. We'll make it a little bit easier to cut and paste. And so our, our hope is that you know, if your um, ad office is the same as your legal address, you usually just write the same as legal address, and you've, you've got that above. So this is our hope, is to actually simplify some of the so we really made it top heavy. This is the critical information is, and this is the kind of more supplemental information. Come in. Nope. So far, so good. Oh, um, attachment three B. So overall, this is the same thought process as attachment three A in terms of consolidating the types of information. Um, I wanted to really point out, because this comes up frequently, we've received a lot of questions about the place of performance address versus the institutional address slash legal address. We've tried to resolve that here by having it more clearly demarcated. So we have the recipient information for FAFATA reporting. We've got a link to the FSRS website for those institutions that are less familiar with it. The, um, this is not actually pull from the same page because the entity, the recipient entity's DUNS name may be different than their actual um, name. So we just wanted to make sure that people were correctly filling in for what it should be. Um, this block here, it is information that only US entities need to enter, which is the congressional district and the zip plus four. Um, so hopefully it will help to clarify for non-US institutions, that box in black just means U.S. institutions. And then we've also added another one of those question boxes here for the place of performance address. All the rest of this is pretty changed from what it was previously. And then you can see that the, the subrecipient's principal investigating carry over from the face page here onto the 3B. 
And we've also given an um, of information for the website for the subrecipient as well as their central email address. We didn't put it up at the top in the same way that we did with 3A contacts just because we really wanted to point out that this information up in the top section is all the information that you should need to find the entity and answer those questions and FSRS along with the information that's on attachment five. So that's all there. Um, and you can you have the option of filling in these addresses or just doing same as place of performance above, et cetera. Um, automatically fills in, but you only have to complete it if you answered no on this button. And oh, we got nine minutes left. Jeez, okay. So attachment four, uh, uh, we separated this into sections um, with rounds. So the technical reports part has actually not changed all that much from the version last year. What we did add though is a prior approval section. Again, this is part of a larger discussion. There'll be more information on this um, in, from historical to serve discussion, maybe a little bit about it in the guidance document. So here you indicate when not carryover is automatic or if it's restricted, you need to indicate if it's restricted by the federal agency or the pass-through entity. The goal of that is to help institutions better understand where this you know, requirement coming from. Um, so there we go. And then we also did under the invention report, some institutions do like to have a negative report invention. Some institutions only want a positive report, and then some institutions just want to be able to validate upon request. So we've added that as a drop down there. And then we tried to simplify all the other special reporting requirements should be here in this box. Then five. Um, We've got either below or attached. And then here we've, um, we've added again that clarification that all amounts are in the United States dollars. And then we've added a drop down for the rate type in order to be able to include more options. There's also a blank there if none of the options fit your circumstance. So NIH foreign rate. That demonstrate TDC, MTDC salaries and wages. I can't think of any, but I think there are one or two other outliers of rate type. But if you find it, you can put it in the other, and then you can just add it into that blank box there. We've got another question box about the cost sharing, which says if the subrecipient has cost shared, then the detailed budget should be attached to the agreement, and additional reporting terms be added in attachment. For. This basically means is if you have a cost share requirement for your subrecipient, you would select yes. Again, you've got to click out of that box. You go back up to attachment four. We're trying to consolidate all reporting requirements. Um, a cost share requirements included below appears in attachment four. And then attachment four is where you would properly place any cost share um, reporting requirements for your subrecipient. And then if you'd like to know, they'll notice that that section is blank. Um, and not much other than that has changed. So attachment six is the option, uh, what, the thing that we did a separate attachment six is for consistency and free in the document itself. So if you're attaching the notice of award, you just be able to add it to the end of the PDF document rather than trying to insert it and renumber pages. We were concerned that that might end up causing coding issues down the road or um, errors or bugs might appear. So we've done this attachment fix to simplify it. If there's additional documentation, such as an MPI leadership plan or um, perhaps a data sharing plan that you wanted to incorporate, that would then become part of this attachment fix. So that's the attached that you saw referenced earlier. Or you can select that you're not incorporating the NOAA or any additional documentation in the sub-award. Just call it 
dates, but that information doesn't need to be there. Any um, A good question came in. It's partially related to the templates and more related to the FAQs, which is, can you recommend a good resource for interpreting uniform guidance rules that are seated in the agreement, do the FCP FAQs provide information or is there another resource? I can kind of tell you from the FAQs are a great resource for this because keep in mind the templates were designed with uniform guidance in mind throughout. Like they designed referencing the uniform guidance as well as using it as the backbone for designing the templates and creating the terms and conditions in the first place. So the FAQs go into detail about, one, what are the required data elements that a pass-through entity must flow down to its subrecipient. And so it goes through a lot of those data elements, each one in the FAQs, as to how it's written in the agreement, how it's originally written in the uniform guidance, and how you can interpret that. And two, there's an Appendix 1 in the FAQs. That is, I would say, it's a chart that shows you where in the uniform guidance as a requirement for a pass-through entity to flow down something to a subrecipient, where you can actually find that in the template. So it's kind of a crosswalk that's showing you this is what it says in uniform guidance, and this is where you can find that in the template. So I do think the FAQs are a great resource for that. That question just came in. Um, is attachment 6, anything else to add, Amanda? I'm going to do the mod quickly, but why don't we do this question and then I can show the mod in two minutes. Attach is attachment six the appropriate place to attach a detailed budget or attachment five? Attachment five, and you'll notice that budget details below or attached. So you can slip it behind attachment five. If you want to, if you end up slipping it behind attachment six, I don't think anyone's going to say boo to you about it. I think it's, as long as the documentation is there, really what the goal and the purpose is, is to just really clearly demarcate what is attached, what is, you know, what, what is incorporated by reference or what is incorporated upon request um, from the PTE to the subrecipient and vice versa. Question, I know we want to get to the agreements. Can you recommend what templates use when the agreement they contract? Yes, we can. There is actually on the website, we have an FTP subcontract sample as opposed to the subaward agreements. Um, that There is a working group right now working on updating the subcontract sample, um, and we're anticipating that the draft of that will be available in January. But at, at the moment, Sorry, uh, yeah. it, it's right here on the subboard page. So it's toward the bottom. It's the SAS thing. Okay. So really quickly, I'm just going to show the unilateral modification. The bilateral modification is up there. Similar changes were made to that, including we've put an amendment number at the top. When you do it, it'll populate this one down here. Um, we'd heard a lot of feedback that the address box was wasn't super helpful, so we've put the email address there instead. Um, and then if you've shared your central email box or um, you've dated something, you can put in the new one. But I would typically recommend leaving that as whatever your office's general mailbox is um, at the PTE or the subrecipient. But it's a nice checkpoint to have some sort of communication vehicle there. You can use whatever address you think is most appropriate for both yourself and or your subrecipient. Uh, so we did a drop down the agency selection and again it's got all of our member agencies and then if it's other you can actually then just type you can actually just blank this out and type in whatever the agency is that you're going to be um, on behalf of. And we've also added um, Assumption here as to whether or not carryover is automatic, just a reminder from the PTE to the subrecipient, and then a general statement reminding the subrecipient that if carryover is not automatic, that they need to make a request to the PTE and that their unobligated balance may be the same as the total amount of federal funds obligated to date in the sense of some of those funds may actually be restricted. So. Um, we wanted to make that clear 
all in the carryover guidance in a lot of detail that you'll be seeing. Yes. Yeah. Great. Were there any questions that came in with that? Uh, with the amendments, no. no. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so just a couple of minor time. time. We're at it. This is the end. Yep. This is everything's on our our website. There's the link to it. Uh, we'll be sending out a call in November, December, just reminding people to let us know if they have questions as they've started to use the templates. We've actually made the business decision that unless something major comes up, we're hoping to not update the templates again until 2019. Um, and I am now at uh, Northeastern. I forgot to update the slide before we started today's webinar. Oops. And it's actually <laughs> just a a dot Humphrey at northeastern.edu that does have to be updated on the website as well. That will all be taken care of in the next few days. And just so folks know, there were a couple of typos in the or like, like bugs in the earlier version of the template. And so we're going to post a final, final, final version of the template. It'll be going up on the website um, hopefully by the end of the week. And also the foreign templates will be being posted soon. So all of those things will come. We will send a notice letting people know these are the final, final documents. We're also going to summarize what the bugs were so that institutions who have started to pre or started programming processes feel like they're back at square one, that they can kind of keep rolling with what they've got. Okay. Well, I think that is it. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.